Welcome to lesson number three, titled Light Shines in the Darkness, ready for teaching on Sabbath, April 20. The author of the series of lessons on the Great Controversy is Pastor Mark Finlay, and your reader this week is Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, April 13. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and your grace. We thank you for the light that shines in the darkness. We thank you for the gospel which has been taken to the whole world and started so long ago. We thank you for the love and story of Jesus Christ that is being shared with so many. And we thank you for the Holy Spirit to help our understanding. Lord, as we come to you this week, we just thank you that there is that light, that light, that hope, that results that will come eventually when Jesus comes, that each of us may get to in person meet God, in person meet Jesus and in person meet the others around the world who have loved and served and given their hearts to him. We pray that as we open your word this week, that Lystra Blake and Nadine Murray and family may be blessed, that Jolene Richardson and her family, and especially her children, may know that you are with them this week, and that the Seventh-day Adventist Church administration around the world, from general conference level right down to local conference and local mission level, may know that you are with them and that your spirit will guide There are not many of us, Lord, but we just thank you that we have this opportunity of studying together. Bless us as we open your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week comes from John chapter 12 and verse 35. Then Jesus said to them, A little while longer the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. Let's read that again, John twelve thirty-five. Then Jesus said to them, A little while longer the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. In the Bible's last book, Revelation, the devil is pictured as a dragon and a serpent. In Revelation 12 verse 19, the great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. He is a dragon because he desires to destroy God's people And he is a serpent because he uses all his cunning lies to deceive them. In the years after Christ's death, thousands were tortured, thrown to lions and burned at the stake by imperial Rome for refusing to worship its deities. Yet, In the face of this cruel punishment, many stayed faithful, the gospel continued to spread, and the church grew. As a result, Satan changed his strategy. Scores of pagans were baptized, but without thorough instruction in Bible truth. Error flooded into the church as leaders merged the truths of Scripture with popular customs. The 4th and 5th centuries were eras of compromise when church prelates blended pagan practices with Christian teachings. Yet, even in life's most difficult times, God was continually with his people. They found Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, they stood firm, even in the face of overwhelming pressure to yield their conscientious convictions. They stayed loyal to God's revealed will in Scripture and unflinchingly stood for the truth of His Word, regardless of the pressure placed on them, either overtly or subtly. Sunday, April 14, Compromise, Satan's Subtle Strategy 
Compare John chapter 14 verse 6 with John 8 verse 44. What contrast between Jesus' character and Satan's is seen in these two passages? John 14 verse 6, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And John 8 verse 44, You belong to your father the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. What Jesus says is true because he is the author of truth. Truth proceeds from the heart of an all-wise, all-loving, all-knowing God. He is the foundation of reality and of all truth. In contrast, Satan is a liar and the father of lies. He is prepared to use lies, deceit, misinformation and a distortion of the truth to lead God's people astray. He deceived Eve in Eden by distorting truth creating doubt, and blatantly denying what God said. Satan's statement, you shall not surely die, in the context of eating the fruit, was a clear contradiction of what God had said. Throughout the centuries, Satan has used the same strategy. He undermines confidence in God's word, contradicts God's revealed will, distorts scripture, and at times misquotes the Bible to his advantage. Read Proverbs chapter 23, verse 23, John 17, 17, and John 8, verse 32. What similarity do you see in these Bible verses regarding the truth of God's word? What is their central message? Proverbs 23, verse 23. Buy the truth and do not sell it. Wisdom, instruction and insight as well. And then John seventeen seventeen, Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. And John 8, verse 32. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Quoting from The Great Controversy, page 51, we read, Satan well knew that the Holy Scriptures would enable men to discern his deceptions and withstand his power. It was by the word that even the Saviour of the world had resisted his attacks. At every assault, Christ presented the shield of eternal truth, saying, It is written. To every suggestion of the adversary, he opposed the wisdom and the power of the word. In order for Satan to maintain his sway over men and establish the authority of the papal usurper, he must keep them in ignorance of the scriptures. The Bible would exalt God and place finite men in their true position. Therefore, its sacred truths must be concealed and suppressed. This logic was adopted by the Roman Church. For hundreds of years, the circulation of the Bible was prohibited. The people were forbidden to read it or to have it in their houses, and unprincipled priests and prelates interpreted its teachings to sustain their pretensions. Thus, the Pope came to be almost universally acknowledged as the Vice-Regent of God on earth, endowed with authority over church and state, end of quote. And so to finish the day, discuss ways that Satan attempts to distort or misinterpret God's word today. Monday, April 15, Savage Wolves Read Acts chapter 20, verses 27 to 32. What specific warnings did the Apostle Paul give to the church leaders from Ephesus regarding the coming apostasy? Acts 20, beginning at verse 27. For I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he brought with his own blood. 
I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So, be on your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. The purpose of Paul's counsel was to prepare the church for what was coming. In these passages, he describes his major concern. His concern is that savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, verse 29. In other words, believers would face fierce persecution from within the church. The apostle expressed his concern when he said, Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them, in verse 30. Heresies would enter the church, false doctrines would be substituted for divine truths, pagan practices would prevail. In the 4th and 5th centuries, compromise subtly crept into the Christian church, with mission advance being the probable justification. But the terrible result was a departure from the truths of God's word. Read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 7 to 12. How does the Apostle Paul describe the coming apostasy? What characteristics should believers look for? 2 Thessalonians, and we go to chapter 2 and start at verse 7. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendour of his coming. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie and all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. Paul's comment, the mystery of lawlessness does already work, is significant. Even in Paul's day, there was a gradual departure from the truth of God's word regarding obedience to God's law. This departure would flourish in the later centuries. Contrary to the second commandment, idols were introduced into Christian worship. For millennia, idols were in the forefront of all pagan religions. To make Christianity more acceptable to heathens coming into the Christian church, pagan deities were renamed as so-called saints. Sunday, the day of worship for the sun god, was gradually adopted as the day of Christian worship in honour of the resurrection. This false day, not sanctioned in scripture, prevails even now. And so to finish the day, what kind of compromises do we see entering the church today? More important, what compromises might you be making? Is it sometimes by blending truth and error? Tuesday, April 16, Safeguarded by the Word Compare John 17, verses 15 to 17, and Acts 20, verse 32. What insights do Jesus and the Apostle Paul give us regarding protection from the deceptions of Satan? John 17, verse 15 onwards. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. And Acts 20 verse 32. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up 
and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. The Bible is the infallible revelation of God's will. It presents heaven's plan for humanity's salvation. Since all scripture is given by the inspiration of God, it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. 2 Timothy 3 verse 16. That is, all scripture is inspired by God, not some parts or some parts more than others. The whole Bible must be accepted as the word of God. Otherwise, the door is wide open for deception. The Bible clearly reveals God's infinite love in the light of the great controversy. It also exposes satanic delusions and reveals the devil's deceptions. Satan hates the word of God and has done everything possible throughout the centuries to destroy its influence. After all, what would we know about the plan of salvation without the Bible? How much, if anything, would we understand about the birth, life, teachings and ministry of Jesus? Without the scriptures, would we even begin to comprehend the depth of Christ's sacrifice, the glory of his resurrection, the power of his intercession and the majesty of his return? All these crucial truths are revealed, taught and emphasised in the word of God. It, and it alone, must be the final and ultimate standard for understanding all sacred truth. Hence, we must fight against any and all attempts to undermine its authority or inspiration, even from those who, while professing great love of the Bible, bring doubts about it, even subtly. Tragically, Especially through the inroads of modern thinking, many theologians and Christians focus so much on the human side of Scripture that the Bible becomes the Word of man instead of the Word of God. The Bible, they argue, is the writings of kings, shepherds, of fishermen, priests, poets and others who shared their understandings and conceptions of God, of nature and of reality the best that they in their time and place understood them. Really now, if this were true, why should we, living today in the 21st century, really care about what these people thought, much less make what they thought the foundation for our hope of eternity? We shouldn't. And so to finish today, read Psalm 119, verses 105, 116, 130, 133 and 160. What insights does the psalmist give us regarding the significance of God's word in the plan of salvation? Psalm 115, verse 105. Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. And verse 116. Sustain me, my God, according to your promise, and I will live. Do not let my hopes be dashed. In verse 130, the unfolding of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. 133, direct my footsteps according to your word. Let no sin rule over me. And verse 160, all your words are true. All your righteous laws are eternal. Wednesday, April 17, Human Reasoning Apart from Scripture The Holy Spirit works through our minds. He invites us to explore the mysteries of the universe. As someone has aptly stated, as Christians, we do not check our brains at the door of the church. Nevertheless, the brilliance of human reasoning alone is incapable of discovering the divine truths of Scripture. Truth is not a matter of human opinion. It is a matter of divine revelation. Read Proverbs 16.25, Judges 21.25 and Isaiah 53 verse 6. What do these texts reveal about Satan's strategy of deception? Proverbs 16.25 There is a way that appears to be right, but in the end it leads to death. 
Judges chapter 21 and verse 25. In those days Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. And Isaiah 53 verse 6. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. One of the devil's most effective deceptions is to lead us to believe that human reasoning, unaided by the Holy Spirit and uninformed by the Word of God, is sufficient to understand God's will. There may be a way that seems right to us or even to entire cultures, but it may be totally wrong in the eyes of God. A few years ago, my wife and I decided to do some hiking in the forest near the hotel we were staying at the for the night. Typically, I am fairly good at directions, and after hiking for about an hour or so through various trails, I was quite confident that I could find our way back with little difficulty. But soon, we found ourselves hopelessly lost in the forest. The sun was going down, and I feared the worst. Thankfully, we met some other hikers who knew the way. We had been at least five miles off course, but near a main road. Since their car was parked nearby, they offered us a ride back to the hotel. Discovering someone who knew the way and someone who had the ability to get us back to our destination made all the difference for us. And by the way, this story is from Mark Finley, the author of our lesson, not Percy Harrell, the one who's reading it. God has not left us alone on our journey from earth to heaven. The Holy Spirit points us to the sacred scriptures that lead us homeward. Truth and error, right and wrong, good and evil, these can be correctly understood only in light of God's word. That which contradicts God and his word is error, and error is always dangerous. That which is in harmony with God is truth and goodness. How important that we make God's word our final arbiter of truth and morality. And so to finish today, why is the human mind, without the aid of the Holy Spirit, incapable of discovering divine truth? Discuss the relationship between human reason and divine revelation. How does reason actually help us understand divine revelation? For example, look at Daniel 2, a prophecy that covers world history from the time of Babylon to the Second Coming. How does a prophecy like this powerfully appeal to human reason? Thursday, April 18, Battle for the Mind. Read 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 to 6. What does whose mind the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, mean? How are their eyes blinded? How are eyes opened? 2 Corinthians 4, beginning at verse 3. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts, to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. The Greek word for mind in this passage is noema. It literally means our perception or mental faculties. The Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary makes an enlightening statement about this verse. The battle between Christ and Satan is a battle for the minds of men. And we are referred to Romans 7.23 and 25, Romans 12.2, 2 Corinthians 3.14, 2 Corinthians 11.3, Philippians 2.5 and Philippians 4 verses 7 and 8, which we'll read shortly. Satan's principal work is to blind or darken men's minds. 
He does this by keeping them from the study of God's word, by deranging the powers of the mind through the excesses of body and soul, by wholly occupying the mind through the things of this life, and by appealing to pride and self-exaltation. That's from volume 6 of the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, page 875. And now to those verses we referred to here. Romans 7, verses 23 to 25. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind, and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am! Who will deliver me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God, who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself, in my mind, am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. And Romans 12 verse 2, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And 2 Corinthians 3 verse 14, But their minds were made dull. For to this day the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed, because only in Christ is it taken away. And 2 Corinthians 11 verse 3. But I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. And Philippians chapter 2 verse 5. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And Philippians chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, Think about these things. The lack of knowledge on the part of the lost is not because they could not know. It is because they would not know. Many have had every opportunity to know truth, but chose not to believe, and Satan blinded their eyes. Satan's kingdom is a kingdom of darkness. As the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary adds, in volume 6, page 854, The gospel is the only means by which Satan's diabolical schemes and deceptions can be exposed, and by which men can see the way from darkness to light. The essence of the New Testament message is the life, death and resurrection of Jesus. Jesus is at the heart of the gospel and is the centre of scripture. All Scripture testifies of Him, as we read in John 5.39. You study the Scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very Scriptures that testify about me. And then, to finish today, we read John 1, verses 4, 5, and 9, and 14, and the question is asked, how do these verses describe Jesus? Note particularly John 1 verse 14. We start with John chapter 1 verse 4. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. And verse 5. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And verse 9. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. And verse 14, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. During the early centuries of the Christian Church, the New Testament believers were totally committed to Christ as the one who was the light in their darkness. They were redeemed by His grace, transformed by His power, and motivated by His love. Even death could not break their bond of loyalty to Christ. They recognized the devil's deceptions in the glorious light of the gospel. 
Christ has always had men and women who, by his grace, have stood courageously for his truth. In these early centuries, the light of Christ's love, grace and truth shone through the darkness. Friday, April 19, Further Thought From the Great Controversy, page 56 and 57, we read, The same spirit of hatred and opposition to the truth has inspired the enemies of God in every age, and the same vigilance and fidelity have been required in his servants. The words of Christ to the first disciples are applicable to his followers to the close of time. What I say unto you, I say unto you all, watch. Mark 13, verse 37. End of quote. In many parts of the world, especially where people have free access to the Bible, Satan has employed other means to weaken its influence. One very effective way has been through various scientific endeavours or even biblical scholarship, which sometimes takes positions that, if accepted, would undermine trust in the Word of God. For example, though the book of Daniel dates itself to more than 500 years before Christ, many Bible scholars date it instead to the middle of the 2nd century BC. They argue that it had to be written at this time, Otherwise, the prophet would have been accurately telling the future, and that can't happen. Therefore, they argue, Daniel was not written when it says it was, but rather hundreds of years later. Unfortunately, this lie about the Bible is one of many that modern scholarship seeks to foist upon us. And more unfortunately, many people accept this error because, after all, Bible scholars are teaching it. No wonder Paul warns us, test all things, hold fast what is good, in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 21. And that brings us to our four discussion questions for this week. 1. Refer to the quote in Tuesday's study, and then consider the following. How is Satan using similar methods today to subtly undermine the authority of the scriptures. And on Tuesday, we were referred to 2 Timothy 3.16, which read, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And question two, what are our greatest safeguards against misinterpreting God's word? Three, Satan's major attempt in the great controversy between good and evil is to malign God's character and present him as an authoritarian, unloving tyrant. How does the evil one attempt to do this, and what is God's response to his lies? Four, the Apostle Peter affirms that no prophecy is of private interpretation in Second Peter 1 verse 20. How can we be sure we do not distort the meaning of the scripture to achieve our own ends? Why might this be easier to do than we realize? And the final part of the question, how can we safeguard ourselves against it? And now it's time for Inside Story with Sibylla Harold. Thank you, Sibylla. More about Sarah, a faithful student in Italy by Andrew McChesney. In Italy, school children have the option of attending an hour of religion classes every week in public school. As a small girl, Sarah decided to attend because she wanted to know more about the Bible. Her classmates quickly realised that she knew the Bible well. So when the teacher asked a question, they would say, Sarah knows the answer. After hearing the children say this for many months, the teacher asked Sarah, How is it that you know the Bible so well? I go to the Seventh-day Adventist church, Sarah said. The teacher wanted to know more, so she went to church with Sarah. Sarah got a new religion teacher in the sixth grade. Again, she was able to answer the teacher's questions. Impressed, the teacher invited her to give an hour-long class presentation about the Adventist Church. Sarah prepared this with help from her pastor and other church leaders. 
At the end of the presentation, classmates peppered her with questions about the Seventh-day Sabbath. Today, Sarah is in high school and her religion teacher is a nun. Once she impressed the nun by writing a Bible verse on an exam. Other teens rarely cited the Bible. The nun asked for an explanation and Sarah told her about her faith. Afterward, the nun came to her church. In another high school class, the teacher grew upset when Sarah could not answer a question about religion in Italy. Sarah explained that she did not know because she was not a member of Italy's largest denomination. The teacher asked several questions and invited Sarah to give the class a lesson about the Adventist church. Sarah's presentation pleased the teacher and she said, It is wonderful to learn about another faith in our class. The next year, however, Sarah had a Saturday class from the same teacher. The teacher pressured Sarah to attend, and when she didn't, she teased her. Please come to school, she said. We won't tell anyone that you came. Week after week, she mocked Sarah. I also could stay home on Saturdays, she said. I would be better than going. It would be better than coming to school. To Sarah's surprise, her classmates began to defend her to the teacher. Then one Sabbath, when Sarah was in church, the teacher praised her to the class. Even though Sarah is only here half the time, she gets better marks than the rest of you, she said. Sarah believes God has blessed her for being open about her faith. I never have hidden my faith from my classmates, she told Adventist Mission. My classmates respect me and know my faith is serious for me. This mission story illustrates spiritual growth objective number seven of the Seventh-day Adventist Church's I Will Go strategic plan to help, you, help youth and young adults plan for God first. For more information, go to the website on iwillgo2020.org.